Ladies and gentlemen, let me welcome you to the current criminal law evening sessions, 1981. This is the fourth year in which these evening lectures have been delivered. In each of those four years, your chairman, your co-chairman of this program have been Mr. Michael J. Moldaver and Mr. Brian H. Greenspan, both of whom you know and who are with me on the platform. Now, needless as it may be, I think their work and energies in this program calls for a little bit of an introduction. Michael Moldaver is a gold medalist at the University of Toronto Law School. He was called to the bar in 1973. Since that time, he has engaged in the practice of criminal law in some relationship with uh, your friend, Mr. Edward Greenspan, uh, first as an associate with him and the last five years in a partnership relationship, now in the firm of Greenspan Moldaver. Michael has lectured at Osgoode Hall Law School and continues to lecture at the University of Toronto Law School and in the bar admission course where he has lectured since 1977. He's a director of the Criminal Lawyers Association and vice chairman of the Ontario Bar Association Criminal Justice Section, co-editor of the Weekly Criminal Bulletin. He has written widely in the field of criminal law and continues his practice devoted to that field. Mr. Brian Greenspan came through the Osgoode Hall Law School graduating in 1971. He then was off to the London School of Economics, having received a Laidlaw Foundation Fellowship to study there, and did his master's degree, took his LLM in 1972. He has participated in the, indeed as Mike has, in the Federation of Law Societies criminal law programs over the past few years, and as I have said, is, has co-chaired this program for the past four. He has lectured in criminal procedure in the Bar Admission Course since 76, and has lectured at Osgoode Hall, is a director of the Criminal Lawyers mm -hmm. Association, and practice, practices exclusively in the field of criminal law in the firm of Greenspan Arnold. These are your co-chairmen, and I'm going to leave it to Brian Greenspan to take on the chairmanship uh, for the rest of the evening and introduce your speakers. Thank you. The <clears throat> Last year when the introductions were first made, one of the comments was that we had been requested in the previous year's suggestions not to be humorous, and the main suggestion uh, as a result of last year's program was that our introductions had improved because we hadn't attempted to in any way be humorous. So these are going to be straight introductions throughout these next five weeks. Our first speaker tonight, and there'll be separate introductions of each, is Mr. Justice Creever, the lecture on abuse of process. Mr. Justice Creever received his Bachelor of Arts in 1951 from the University of Toronto. Bachelor of Law from the University of Toronto in 1954, was called to the bar in 1956, QC January of 1970. From 1956 until 1964, he engaged in counsel work with the firm of Kimber and Dubbin. 1964 to 1968 was a professor of law at the University of Toronto. 1969 to 74, professor of law at the University of Western Ontario, and then returned to the University of Toronto for a year until his appointment to the Supreme Court on November 27, 1975. While at the bar, he was editor-in-chief of the Dominion Law Reports, Ontario Reports, 
and Canadian criminal cases from 1967 until 1976, and a bencher of the Law Society from 1971 until 1976. For the last few years, Justice Creever's name has been in the newspapers rather frequently and primarily his relationship as chairman of the Royal Commission of Inquiry into the Confidentiality of Health Records. He's also alternate chairman of the Advisory Review Board of Ontario. Our first speaker, Mr. Justice Creever. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'd like to begin with just two preliminary matters. The first is a promise that uh, the paper that you will eventually receive reflecting um, the topic I'm to speak on will be considerably more organized and fuller than the, uh, the talk I'm about to give, uh, which will be more or less of a rambling nature. The second preliminary point is just to say that the subject of abuse of process in criminal cases is one in which the last word has not yet been said or written. As you'll see from what I hope to say, um, the problem is the language of the Supreme Court of Canada in the Roar case and what, subsequent, um, what courts in subsequent cases have uh, said about that decision. And uh, uh, let me say nothing more by way of preliminary discussion. I think everything else I want to say will come up in, uh, in the course of my remarks. It was in 1977 that uh, the Supreme Court of Canada in Rourke and the Queen, 35 Canadian Criminal Cases, Second Series, one, page 129, considered the question whether or not a court of criminal jurisdiction more particularly in that case a county court judge, had the inherent power to stay proceedings where an abuse of the court's process was shown. Mr. Justice Pigeon, writing on behalf of the majority, said, and this is the sentence that has caused all the difficulty, I cannot admit of any general discretionary powers in courts of criminal jurisdiction to stay proceedings regularly instituted because the prosecution is considered oppressive. The minority, speaking through Chief Justice Laskin, clearly accepted the existence of such powers in uh, the courts exercising criminal jurisdiction, including courts other than the superior courts of criminal jurisdiction. The majority judgment of Mr. Justice Pigeon has been the subject of conflicting judicial opinion in both inferior and superior courts of criminal jurisdiction across the country. So much so that it is unclear whether the doctrine of abusive process is confined to civil matters or whether it has applicability in criminal matters as well. It's, it's, long, it's been long recognized that the courts and civil proceedings have an inherent jurisdiction to stay proceedings before it, or before them, which are frivolous or vexatious or an abuse of their process. The doctrine was enunciated by the House of Lords in Metropolitan Bank in Pooley in 1885, 10 appeal cases, page 218. More recently, in one of the abuse of, processes, pre, abuse of process cases in criminal matters, um, Re Abarca and the Queen, 1980, 57 C Canadian Criminal Cases, Second Series, page 410, Mr. Justice Le Cursier for the Court of Appeal said, whereas in civil proceedings the court has a clear inherent jurisdiction to prevent abuse of process by vexatious or oppressive proceedings, in criminal proceedings, it is at least open to question whether there still exists a general discretionary power to stay or quash proceedings regularly instituted on the ground that the prosecution is considered oppressive. And a quotation there is uh, Rourke. You'll find in the Judicature Act, I think it's section 18, a reflection of the inherent power of the Supreme Court of Ontario, at any rate, to uh, stay proceedings on the ground of um, um, abuse of process, and it's not a grant of power that you find in that section, it's a recognition that the courts continue to have that power. So it's not a, a case in which you can say, well, the province can't 
confer jurisdiction in criminal matters on the courts. As I say, it's not a conferring of power, it's a recognizing of the existence of the power. And I would have thought, in the absence of any authority, that if the courts have an inherent jurisdiction because they're masters of their own procedure and are entitled to control their own procedure, to prevent proceedings which are an abuse of process in civil matters, that a fortiori they would be thought to have that power where the liberty of the subject is at stake. That apparently is not the view of some people, some people whose opinions must be respected, both here and uh, in, um, in England. Because ever since the, the pronouncements by the highest courts, by a majority, there have been um, efforts made by other courts to distinguish the, the cases, to uh, say they didn't mean what they said, and uh, I hope to come to a case in which I had that same problem. Connolly and the Director of Public Prosecutions, 1964, Two All England Reports, page 401, a decision of the House of Lords was the first case to explore at length the applicability of the doctrine of abuse of process in criminal proceedings. In that case, the accused was charged with murder in circumstances in which the murder was alleged to have occurred in the course of a robbery. The conviction for murder was quashed on appeal, and subsequently the accused was charged with robbery. One of the questions that came before the House of Lords was whether the trial judge ought to have stayed the second indictment on the ground that the proceeding cons constituted an abuse of process. Although the members of the House were unanimous in holding that there had not been any abuse in the case, they were sharply divided as to the scope of the discretion of a court to stay proceedings for abuse of process. The leading judgment, in my view, on this question was that of Lord Devlin, who was of the view that a general power to prevent unfairness to the accused existed as part of the criminal law. And in contrast, Lord Morris perceived the power as being a very narrow one. In Canada, the same question was raised in Regina and Osborne, 1970, one Canadian criminal case's second series, page 482, a decision of the Supreme Court of Canada reversing the judgment of the Ontario Court of Appeal. In that case, after an acquittal on a charge of forgery and after delay caused by the appeal by the Crown, the Crown laid a charge of conspiracy to utter forged documents, which charge arose from the same facts and circumstances as the original forgery charge. The Ontario Court of Appeal held that the second proceeding should have been stayed as an abuse of process. Now, mind you, this is back in 1970. Speaking for the court, Mr. Justice Jessup, who's been consistent throughout the cases, as you'll see, quoted from the speech of Lord Devlin in the Connolly case and said, uh, quoting Lord Devlin, as a general rule, a judge should stay an indictment, that is, order that it remain on the file not to be proceeded with, when he is satisfied that the charges therein are founded on the same facts as the charges in a previous indictment on which the accused has been tried, or form or, par or are part of a series of offenses of the same or a similar character as the offenses charged in the previous indictment. Because, he said, it's oppressive to an accused for the prosecution not to do so. But a second trial on the same or similar facts is not always necessarily oppressive, and there may be in a particular case special circumstances which make it just and convenient in that case. The judge must then, in all the circumstances of the particular case, exercise his discretion as to whether or not he applies the general rule. That's what um, Mr. Justice Jessup was quoting. On appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada, Messrs. Justice Ritchie, Hall, and Spence stated that the question whether or not the court has jurisdiction to intervene to prevent an abuse of its process did not have to be decided because there was no evidence to support the conclusion of the Court of Appeal that there was oppression. Messrs. Justices Martland, Judson, and Pigeon held that there does not exist in our criminal law a rule that in the case of multiplicity of charges successively made on the same facts, a trial judge has a discretion to stay an indictment when on all the facts of the case, laying it is considered an injustice amounting to oppression. Mr. Chief Justice Fauteau, without giving any reasons, agreed that the appeal should be allowed. So you have a split decision with the swing vote, if I can call it that, giving no reasons or indicating nothing but um, what the result ought to be. It should be noted that in Rourke, Chief Justice Lascom, who was 
dissenting on the issue I'm concerned with, points out that Mr. Justice Pichon did not assert in Osborne that a court may not in any circumstances stay or dismiss criminal proceedings for an abusive process. Both the House of Lords and Director of Public Prosecution in Humphreys in 1976, I'll omit the citation, but you'll have it in, your, uh, in the paper that you get, and the Supreme Can Court of Canada in Rourke had the opportunity to re-examine the doctrine of abusive process. In both courts, there was again a difference of opinion regarding the use of the doctrine in criminal proceedings. In Rourke, the accused was charged with kidnapping and robbery, both alleged to have taken place in 1971. He was, however, not arrested until approximately one and a half years later, although he had throughout that time lived openly in the community. Evidence was given that the resulting delay had prejudiced the accused in obtaining witnesses crucial to his defense. At the opening of his trial in county court, the accused moved to have the proceeding state as an abuse of the court's process. The motion was granted, and on appeal, the British Columbia Court of Appeal held that the appeal should be allowed. Now, Mr. Justice McIntyre, speaking on behalf of the five-judge court, held that in this particular case, the exercise of discretion by the trial judge was not warranted since the alleged oppression was due to matters that arose prior to the prosecution and was not due to the conduct of the prosecution itself. He did, however, Mr. Justice McIntyre did, however, address the issue of the inherent jurisdiction of trial judges in criminal proceedings to, say, to stay such proceedings. He held that such inherent jurisdiction to stay proceedings to protect the process of the court from abuse by oppressive conduct on the part of the prosecution did exist. You'll find this is common in most of the cases of uh, abusive process. Even those cases in which the court says there does exist the power, you can say that the statement is obiter because they go on to say, however, in the particular case, no abuse occurred. This was one such case at the Court of Appeal level. He held also that the jurisdiction was not limited to superior courts of criminal jurisdiction. He said that the power must be used sparingly and only in the clearest cases. On appeal to the Supreme Court of Canada, all nine members of the court concurred that the situation before them did not justify a stay of proceedings. However, they split five to four regarding the powers of a trial judge to prevent an abusive process in criminal proceedings. Mr. Justice Pigeon, speaking for the majority, said this, I cannot find any rule in our criminal law that prosecutions must be instituted promptly and ought not to be permitted to be proceeded with if a delay in instituting them may have caused prejudice to the accused. In fact, no authority was cited to establish the existence of such a principle, which is at variance with the rule that criminal offenses generally are not the subject of prescription, except in the case of specific offenses for which a prescription, a prescription time has been established by statute. I have to disagree with the view expressed by Mr. Justice McIntyre that there could be factual situations giving to a trial judge discretion to stay proceedings for delay. For the reasons I gave in Osborne, I cannot admit of any general discretionary powers, power in courts of criminal jurisdiction to stay proceedings regularly instituted because the prosecution is considered oppressive. In fact, I think the correct view is that which was expressed as follows by Viscount, Viscount Dillhorn in Director of Public Prosecutions at Humphreys. And there then follows an extensive quotation which I will not bother you with except to go to the last uh, paragraph of the quotation after, after referring to what other members of the House of Lords thought on the subject. He said, if there is the power which my noble and learned friends think there is to stop a prosecution on indictment in limine, it is, in my view, a power that should only be exercised in the most exceptional circumstances. Now, I confess that I've taken comfort in that, in that qualification because Mr. Justice Pigeon, for the majority, says that's the correct view. He, he adopts the view of Viscount Dillhorn, and it seems to me that Viscount Dillhorn is saying that, uh, I'm not saying it doesn't exist in any case, but if it does, it should only be exercised in the most exceptional circumstances. So the problem is, it seems to me, to decide whether on the facts of any given case, you can say it falls within that classification of um, a case involving the most exceptional circumstances. Chief Justice Laskin, who was a member of the Ontario Court of Appeal when Osborne was decided and who had concurred in that judgment, restated the opinion reflected in the judgment in the Court of Appeal. He perceived the doctrine of abusive process as an overriding mode of controlling criminal procedure. 
He said, in a broad sense, pleas of outre fois of convict and acquit and of res judicata and issue estoppel may be said to be aspects of abusive process. They may be regarded as crystallized means of control having a particular ambit of operation, but not exhaustive of the scope of abusive process. To recognize it as a desirable general notion for judicial control of the criminal process does not mean that its only bounds are the discretion of a trial judge which must inevitably be respected. That discretion must itself be addressed to situations capable of being embraced in the general notion and cannot itself be the touchstone of abusive process. And he then went on to categorize the type of cases in which judges have used abusive process as a way of controlling prosecution behavior in order to show how varied the fact situations are or may be. He said, they do indicate by their diversity the utility of a general principle of abusive process which judges should be able to invoke in appropriate circumstances to mark their control of the process of their courts and to require fair behavior of the Crown towards accused per persons. And he summed up his views as follows. If, as I think, and as all members of the House of Lords and Connolly recognized, there is merit in the principle that a criminal court, like a civil court, is entitled to protect its process from abuse, the question of discretion becomes a matter of discipline key to particular situations which, as an outgrowth of case law, commend themselves as of a kind in which the principle may be raised. Apart from the generality of support for the proposition that a criminal court may stay proceedings which are an abusive process or oppressive and vexatious, and that, in the view at least of Lord Edmund Davies, which in the view I hold, the power may be invoked by every court having criminal jurisdiction, such courts being presided over in Canada, generally by persons qualified as lawyers, neither Connolly nor Humphreys are of direct assistance in the present case. They do, however, underline, as I would myself, that the power to prevent abuse of process is one of special application, and its exercise cannot be a random one. Well, so much for the main case, or the base case, or the case that causes all the difficulty. There were two subsequent decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada. I'm going to come very briefly to the interpretations given by the appellate courts across Canada. Before I do, I want to refer to two decisions in the Supreme Court of Canada, which suggest perhaps that Rourke wasn't the final answer, didn't completely close the door to the operation of the doctrine. The first is Cranenberg, 1980, and the second is Kersner. I've got them in the reverse order, but that's the order in which I'm going to deal with them. In Cranenburg, Mr. Justice Dixon, speaking for a unanimous court, including Mr. Justice Pigeon, said, the question of whether a new information may be laid after jurisdiction has been lost is not before us, and I refrain from any extended discussion on the point in the absence of argument and on the narrow facts of this case. It is manifest, however, that there will be occasions on which the laying of a new information will not be available. Time limitations may preclude it. Indeed, the laying of another information may amount to nothing less than an abuse of process. In Kersner, in 1978, Chief Justice Laskin said, having indicated that I prefer to leave open the question whether entrapment, if established, should operate as a defense, I express no view on the approach taken in the Hawkness case, which was a 1976 case in the British Columbia Provincial Court. Similarly, I leave open the question whether the appropriate way to deal with entrapment is by a stay of proceedings, a matter, a matter considered by this court in another context in Rourke. Now, it seems to me that it can be said that uh, the judges of the Supreme Court of Canada have not uh, are not all in agreement that Rourke is the last word. I think myself that the doctrine does exist and needs to exist, uh, but I also think that the, the Supreme Court of Canada has to have another look at it because of the conflicting views of, of the courts across the province. Another thing, and perhaps this is an inappropriate thing to say, and maybe it's um, uh, totally irrelevant, but the human factor is not unimportant. And I find it interesting to look at the Constitution or the composition of the court in Rourke and see that the majority consisted of Mr. Justice Pigeon, Mr. Justice Martland, Mr. Justice Ritchie, Mr. Justice Betts, and Mr. Justice de Grandpre. The minority consisted of Chief Justice Laskin, Mr. Justice Judson, Mr. Justice Spence, 
and Mr. Justice Dixon. Gone now are, Mr. are Messrs. Justices Pigeon, de Grandpre, Judson, Spence. Two from each side. But perhaps most significant is the arrival of Mr. Justice McIntyre, whose judgment for the British Columbia Court of Appeal the majority disagreed with. I wonder if the court as constituted today might not be prepared to take a fresh look at it and uh, come to a different conclusion. As I've indicated, the majority judgment in Rourke as delivered by Mr. Justice Pigeon has been the subject of conflicting judicial decisions across Canada. The question has been addressed whether Mr. Justice Pigeon denied the existence of any inherent jurisdiction in criminal proceedings or whether he was just denying the existence of a broad jurisdiction to state proceedings. In the paper that you'll be getting, you'll see uh, an allocation of the cases to various categories. Some courts have concluded that the doctrine of abusive process is no longer available in Canada. I take that to be the view of the Manitoba Court of Appeal in Katagas and the British Columbia Court of Appeal in Lebrun and Persanti two, in two decisions, despite the fact that it was their case, um, that Rourke was their case, they, since the decision of the Supreme Court of Canada at Rourke seemed to be of the view that the uh, doctrine no longer exists. Other courts have concluded that the doctrine, if available, um, is available, except in cases having to do with delay. In other words, Rourke should be confined to its facts. And uh, there are a group of, there's a group of cases of that category. Other courts have looked at subsequent decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada and have concluded that the doctrine still exists, but it should be used only in exceptional circumstances. That case, the case cited there happens to be the case that uh, I was involved in, and I hope to return to it. Other cases are cases in courts which say that the uh, main issue is left open, but on the particular facts there was no uh, abuse. And the Ontario Court of Appeal has said that uh, on many occasions, they say, including the Abarca case, which I just referred to, and other cases in which they say, assuming without deciding that abuse of process is still available, there was, in this case, no abuse. And uh, I've got seven cases in the Court of Appeal um, in which the abuse of process has arisen, and you'll have all the citations of the man, the uh, styles of cause, when you get to the paper, um, and some reference was made to it, but no definitive statement that it does exist, that the doctrine does exist, will be found there. Because in each one of those cases, the court held that on the facts before it, there was no abuse. Um, the uh, strongest proponent of the existence of the doctrine in the Ontario Court of Appeal has been in several cases, Mr. Justice Jessup, as I've indicated, uh, he went out of his way in the Abitibi case. It was a unanimous decision. That case was one of a charge under the uh, Environmental Protection Act. The court held that it wasn't strictly criminal, and therefore the abuse of process doctrine existed because it was not excluded um, since it wasn't a criminal case. Mr. Justice Jessup went on to say, even in a criminal case, the, the doctrine exists. And I've indicated to you already that Mr. Justice Lecursier, in the most recent, recently reported decision in the Court of Appeal, Barker and the Queen said uh, that it was open to question whether it still exists, but assuming without deciding that it does, uh, it didn't, um, the, the facts of the case were not such as to enable a court to say there was a, um, um, an abuse. The most recent case, not yet reported, but it's in the the uh, criminal law bulletin, weekly, cr weekly criminal bulletin, weekly criminal bulletin, is Riley, a decision of the Court of Appeal, uh, by um, Mr. Just, written by Mr. Justice Morden. Now, so the, if you look at the appellate courts, the paper that you get will deal with courts other than the appellate courts, including uh, provincial courts, um, just for completion. But if you look at what the provincial appellate courts have said, 
As I read them, British Columbia and Manitoba says there's no doctrine in criminal cases. Alberta, um, you can't, they're not clear. It's not clear whether the Alberta Court of Appeal thinks, but they certainly haven't shut the door to it. And Ontario and Quebec also say that uh, uh, the door may not be closed, but it's, it's arguable. And uh, I've given you those cases. I will also give you in the paper the uh, citation of Riasselin and the Queen, which is the Quebec Court of Appeal position. I don't think it would be a useful, it would be a sensible use of your time for me to go through all the cases now, uh, just to give you the cases and, and uh, what they say, because I think I've adequately summarized them uh, in what I've already said. But I think it can be said that since Rourke, most of the cases, at least in the um, appellate courts, and perhaps in the superior courts as well, as opposed to the cases in the provincial courts, are cases in which it was held um, that if the doctrine is alive in criminal cases, the um, cases were not cases in which the abuse had, had in fact shown to, had been shown to exist, and therefore one can say that there, those statements about the ex continuing existence of the doctrine really are uh, uh, obiter dicta. For example, the most recent case is in the, uh, on the subject is in the current part of the Canadian criminal cases, the one that came to me at least this week. It's a case called Re Young and the Queen, uh, 1981-60 Canadian criminal cases, second series, page 252, a decision of Mr. Justice Wright of the Saskatchewan Court of Queen's Bench. He went on at some length saying that the doctrine does exist, at least to the extent that a superior court of criminal jurisdiction uh, in a case involving the prerogative writs can step in and prevent an abusive process in uh, an inferior court of criminal jurisdiction um, because he said Rourke didn't decide that. Rourke was only deciding that uh, the county court couldn't stay the, uh, the prosecution. Um, and I'm going to limit Rourke to its facts. He then went on and said in, I think, about one line, but there was no abuse in this case. So again, um, it's a... Uh, it's really a dictum. Now, there are some cases in which, since Rourke, the courts have held that there is a doctrine of an abusive process and uh, the, an abuse did occur in this case. The, to me, um, the most exceptional facts were in the case that I tried in, um, in Windsor last year about this time. It's reported in uh, 1980, 55 Canadian criminal cases, second series, page one. I was hoping this would be the case to go to the Supreme Court of Canada because it seemed to me that the facts were uh, uh, such, and I'm gonna give them to you in a minute, as to make it impossible for a court to say there was no abuse. But what I did in that case was, in fact, grant the motion, stayed the indictment against the one accused, there were multiple accused, accused persons in that case. Um, and, but I don't know, uh, uh, maybe Mr. Doherty knows, uh, whether there's an appeal from a judge who stays, uh, stays an, a superior court judge who stays an indictment on the basis that it's an abuse of process. I don't know that there's an appeal from that because it's not an acquittal. I don't know what it is. On the other hand, unlike uh, a decision of a, uh, say, a county court judge um, mandamus or prohibition or certiorari does not lie to a judge of the superior court, so it can't be tested in that way. Uh, maybe that's the reason it didn't go further, but I, I, wished, <laughs> I wished it had, because um, I held in that case that indeed the doctrine does exist, and that indeed in that case there was, in fact, an abuse um, a process. What was involved in that case was a charge of manslaughter against three, well, initially four accused. One didn't come to trial because he was killed in a motor vehicle accident. Uh, the other three came to trial, and at the opening of the trial, there was a motion to stay the indictment against two of them, but I'm only concerned with one because there was no, I, I held no merit in the uh, application as far as one of the accused was concerned. The case is called 
Regina and Cernick, C-R-N-E-C-K, Bradley and Shelley. And it's uh, 1980, 55 Canadian criminal cases, second series. I may have given you this citation, uh, page one. Uh, what happened in that case was that the, um, one of the accused persons, Bradley, a woman by the name of Bradley, and her lawyer had given an informal statement to the police about the circumstances of the killing, and it was understood that it was informal, would not be used by the, by the Crown. Um, later on, one of the other accused, Cernick, um, took off to British Columbia in violation of the conditions of the recognizance under which he was released on bail, and while in custody in uh, British Columbia, had made some utterances to the police, to the RCMP, and the utterances um, related to the circumstances of the killing. Um, later on, again, the um, Crown, not the Crown, the police, I should say, went to uh, the accused Bradley and to her lawyer, and a deal was made with the full cooperation and participation of the uh, assistant Crown attorney who then had charge of the case. And the deal was, if you give us a written statement um, that's consistent with what you told us back at the time you made the informal statement, and also consistent to with what we know from our investigation, including what the now deceased accused, the one who was killed in a motor vehicle accident, said, um, we will drop the charge against you, provided you agree uh, to testify at the trial. There's no, this was a, a, a case in which the facts were admitted, so there's no dispute that that deal was made. Um, she gave such a statement. She gave a statement which was consistent, which was not inconsistent, let me put it that way, with the other uh, information that the Crown had, and that was the deal, until the case, the file, moved from the assistant Crown attorney who had been in charge up until that time to a new Crown, who looked at the entire circ circumstances and said, it's not in the interest of justice for us to respect that agreement, uh, the deal's off. Now, it was on that basis that the application was made. As I say, the facts were admitted. There's no question that a deal was made. There's no question that she lived up to her part of the bargain, gave a statement uh, which complied with the um, conditions laid down by the Crown, and uh, nevertheless was facing trial on a charge of manslaughter. Well, I had to look at the cases, and I, I'm not going to read the case to you, but I had to look at the cases, first of all, to decide whether or not I had any power to stay the indictment against her. And I concluded that this was an exceptional case, and it fell within that, the qualification uh, that Mr. Justice Pigeon adopted uh, from the House of Lords. And then I said, the next question is, can it be said that there was an abusive process in this case, and I thought there was in two respects. Um, the first was I was greatly assisted by a, by a learned decision, and it was learned of Judge Grayburn in Betesh, and another uh, case to which I've already referred, and that is the Abitibi case. In both of those cases, the courts held that the Crown should be required to abide by its agreements. In the case of uh, uh, Betesh, decided by Judge Grayburn, there had been a strike in the public service, and as part of the settlement of the strike, there was a promise made by the Crown, the Federal Crown, that there would be no prosecutions for anything done during the strike. Um, nevertheless, the Crown, now the Provincial Crown, laid charges in respect of something done during that strike, and uh, the question was whether or not uh, they could be permitted to go back on their word. Judge Grayburn held, first of all, that the Crown was indivisible and it didn't matter that the agreement was made by the Federal Crown and it was now the Provincial Crown that was backing out of it and held that the, the Crown was bound to carry out its agreements. And Mr. Justice um, 
Jessup discussed this in the Abitibi case. That was the prosecution under the Environmental Protection Act in which a company w was asked to clean up its operation and uh, it was understood that if it did uh, install uh, the necessary equipment to prevent the amount of pollution that had been going on, it would not be prosecuted. It did so and nevertheless it was uh, prosecuted and the Court of Appeal held that it was a civil case because it was not criminal, it was under a provincial act, uh, which complicates it because we get this strange constitutional <coughs> concept which you wouldn't find, say, anywhere else. And they were able to say, in civil cases, there is such a doctrine. And Mr. Justice Jessup went on to say, it doesn't matter whether it was civil or criminal, there is such a doctrine. And in any event, the Crown's got to abide by its agreement. That was the first one, but I wasn't sure in my own mind when I said that, whether that, uh, what the Supreme Court of Canada would think about that. I went on to say, in any event, there's a more compelling reason that this is an exceptional case, and that is this. If the accused were required to go to trial, and if she decided to go into the witness box in her own defense, as she has a right to do, she could be cross-examined by counsel for uh, the other accused to whom, at whom she pointed the finger of blame. And that other accused counsel could cross-examine her to show that she made a deal with the Crown, that she ought not to be believed because she was trying to save her own skin. Uh, and the jury might say, well, there she is sitting in the prisoner's dock, the Crown made a deal, they must think she's guilty, they must have good reason to think she's guilty. I thought that she might be in some way uh, prevented, uh, deterred from going into the witness box because of the prospect of being so cross-examined, and I thought that was an impairment of her right to make full, full answer in defense, and that the cumulative effect of the proposition that the Crown should carry out its bargain and the exposure to this jeopardy was such to make it surely a case within the uh, qualification exceptional circumstances and held uh, that the uh, uh, indictment <coughs> as against her ought to be stayed and the case proceeded against the other two. Just a postscript, uh, nothing to do with the subject, but in the case the Crown did not call her. After she was let out, the Crown did not call her. And uh, without her, they were unable on the facts of the case, on the evidence, in fact to establish who the actual killer was to such an extent that at the end of the trial, I felt I had to and did direct uh, the jury to acquit the other two accused. Um, well, I think probably I've said more than I should have said, but uh, the paper you get will say, will give you all the cases that I've just uh, skimmed over. <laughs>